Hey folks, Francis Paul Rip here. We started the Rip Report um, almost 16 years ago in Fairhope, Alabama. Uh, we're a consumer group, not for profit group. No one's paying us or anything. And we try to inform the public on just what's going on, particularly in politics and any corruption that's around. We also have Baldwin County Legal Eagle, which is the sister side of uh, the Rip Report. And we have the ripreport.com and Backstory Podcast. All of these are dedicated to telling you what's going on in the community. And one of the things that's been going on for a few years is there's a group called Catalyst. And Catalyst is a group of politicians or political moguls, if you will, that have gotten together. They're financed by developers, uh, mostly developers, and political people that are looking after their own interest. Catalyst is not looking after the interest of the general public. Now, in 2018, Catalyst ran a, a block candidate's for the county commission, county commission, county positions, judges, probate. And not until about a few weeks before the election did anyone realize that this block vote of people was going, possibly could be elected. Had it not been from several social media sites, ours as well as others, Catalyst might have gotten control of the entire county commission and the entire county government which should scare the hell out of everybody. Catalyst Pride right now has a city council in Fairhope. In fact, that's where Catalyst originated from. One of the council members' sons actually runs Catalyst. So you can see that they're getting inside information on different things, and God knows what the city council of Fairhope has cost the citizens of um, Fairhope in the last three or four years. Hopefully, Everybody's going to understand and see when they run as a block, as Catalyst, you better stand up. But today we're talking about the congressional race, the first congressional district. This was Bradley Burns' old position. You've got five candidates in that position. One is a Catalyst candidate. The last thing we need is a congressional can candidate or a congressional Catalyst individual in Washington. That's the last thing that we need. If he's put in by Catalyst, he's going to support Catalyst. Now, I'm not saying anything personally about Mr. Hightower's family or anything like that. He is the one that chose to go with Catalyst. And, you know, when you hang around with dogs, you get fleas. So that's his decision, not mine. But I'm here to tell you to be very leery of who you vote for. Uh, I hope that you will share this message and you'll get it around to other voters in Baldwin County. It is not in our best interest that we support Catalyst. So I'm asking you on Tuesday, the uh, 3rd, that when you vote, that you vote for any one of the other four candidates. Try to eliminate Catalyst. See if we can get that out of our political system here in Baldwin County. I also hope that you will share this message uh, throughout the social media site so where people can be aware of this. I appreciate your time. Any comments you have, we'll be happy to hear from you from the RIP Report. If you go to the RIP Report, you can read a lot more about Catalyst. You can go back almost four years in our written editions, and this will tell you what you want to know. Any other information, we'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you, and have a good evening. Don't forget to vote on third. Do not vote for Catalyst. And I can't find a seconder usually when I prefer this, but I don't care. I don't need a seconder. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass. First things first, Alabama State Bar Rules of Professional Conduct, Rule 7.2e, requires the following language in all attorney communications. No representation is made that the quality of legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers. My name's Harry Steele, Backwood Southern Lawyer. 
my friend and partner Paul Rip is here. How you doing, Paul? Very good, very good. Number, uh, what is this, 23? 23, and I want to give you guys a little, a little, uh, something that we loaded up on the roadcaster. I hope you'll like it. This is, uh, Governor Ivy, and, um, well, I'll just let you listen. Well, these are a couple of high-stepping tur- uh, turkeys, and you know what to say about a high-stepper. No step too high for a high-stepper. No step too high for a high-stepper. You only hear that in Alabama. Indeed. So, that was part of one of the best speeches I've ever heard her give and a reason that I'm a supporter of the governor. And when we outro today, we're going to play it in its entirety, not up here behind us, but you're going to see the whole speech where she pardoned the turkey on the uh, steps of the state house. All right, Paul, let's talk about, uh, so Paul and I went to, uh, well, quite separately, you went the night before and I drove up the morning of, uh, Wednesday was committee meeting day in Montgomery and uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee was uh, he- having a hearing on medical cannabis. Correct. And uh, I actually went to meet with uh, Representative McMillan about some state and local government issues. Uh, but I did catch some of it. And uh, was is it safe to say that you like Cam Ward after seeing him operate in uh, that environment? I must say Cam did a very good job. He was heading the uh, Judiciary Committee, and he has done so for 10 years. The meeting was probably about two and a half, almost three hours long, and he kept it going along very quickly. And it was was boring as hell stuff. They were just going in and adding to and taking out technicalities in the bill. At least that's the part that I caught. This is uh, State Bill 165 introduced by uh, Senator Town, Tim Melson. He's from M-E-L-S-O-N from Florence. Uh, uh, Tim is also Dr. Melson. He's an anesthesiologist as well as a medical researcher. And um, he, about a couple of years ago, was uh, mm-hmm. totally different, had a totally different opinion about medical marijuana, and he started researching it, did a 180, and has spent a good bit of time bringing this bill to the Judiciary Committee. In fact, everyone on the committee, every senator, complimented him for staying on it. Now, um, this bill regulates uh, medical marijuana from seed to sale, and um, it, uh, there were many amendments added, nothing that radically changed anything. It uh, cleared this committee with an 8-1 vote with one abstaining. That'll make us the 34th state in the United States if it passes the House. Um, Hey, let's talk about this real quick. All right. Now, this bill came forward after, after last year when the governor appointed this medical cannabis study commission correct that's correct that's made of doctors lawyers and professionals in the field and they what about anybody that knows anything about what they're talking about well they're supposed to know what they're talking about and they passed it they passed with recommendations a 12-3 vote with three abstentions to the uh, which gave uh mr melson the um ammunition he needed to go ahead with sb 165 all right so the these people are Medical professionals, not some, sh- not somebody that studied studied under some damn shaman uh, down in the Amazon or something like that. No, and the thing that the, the thing that people need to understand is most legislation is adopted by some previous state that's already, you know, you don't reinvent the wheel every time. They just there's 33 states that have already done this, so. When people tell you, oh, well, we want to study it, well, that's that's ridiculous. The studying's been going on forever. I think Israel's been studying marijuana since the 50s. But um, All right, let's talk about this. All right. Um, when we say medical cannabis. Correct. We are, talk- we are not talking about people being able to go into a dispensary and buy marijuana flower no this is uh medical marijuana this is non-smokable now in some states there's uh you can't smoke mar- medical so, marijuana all right. so it's gummies uh patches CD, cdb patches, oil. oil stuff stuff of that nature correct uh, and some are geared directly towards uh, 
uh, you know, certain diseases and everything. Uh, it's been it's been proven um, very helpful to a lot of people, extremely helpful to a lot of people. One of the things that uh, I was approached while I was there uh, by K, I I mean, sorry, Che Garrigan, who is the Alabama Cannabis Industry Association uh, lobbyist, and she would brought up the point that uh, there's no Alabama veterans group that is for medical marijuana. I mean, there's no group at all. And that really fascinated me because uh, veterans, there's like 370,000 veterans in the state of Alabama, and uh, we have a 20% higher rate of veteran suicide than other states. And being a veteran who has gone to the Birmingham hospital for 52 years, I can tell you that most of the doctors up there, they can't tell you, yes, use it, but they will tell you every time that uh, if you know of a drug that will help your situation, then you should be able to use it. So um, I'm going to be interested to see if this bill goes through the House. If it doesn't go through the House, what I'm suggesting to the lobbyist uh, is that they first organize the veterans because uh, – uh, politicians seem to pay a little bit of attention when, say, a couple thousand veterans show up. But it surprised me that uh, there wasn't any representation there. I thought the meeting went very, very well. I was uh, surprised at the attendance. It was standing room only. And uh, quite a few women involved in the um decriminalization of it, working with uh, different uh, aspects of the law and pushing it. I was I was impressed by the way the whole meeting went. So just like anything else the state of Alabama does, uh, they're, they're going to limit the number of dispensaries, which uh, will make it a bribe-worthy, coveted thing to have, of course. Correct. And um, – all right, so let's talk about this. Uh, last week we talked about the district attorney in Los Angeles just commuted the sentence of 66,000 uh, marijuana drug uh, Cases. convictions and, yeah. and expunged them. So the same week, a guy in Michigan, where it's been legal to sell medical marijuana for a decade, uh, this guy owned five dispensaries and the uh, a federal judge gave him 16 years in federal prison last week. So that's, again, driving home the stake in the heart of my point until it's decriminalized federally. Okay, so let's say you get one of these 31 dis- dispensary uh, uh, permits or, or, or licensures. Um, are you going to... are, are are you going to uh, run the risk that this guy did of going to prison for 16 years? I, you know, that case, I'd like to look at that case a little further. I, I don't understand how they could segregate out one. Well, I do, and let me tell you this. Jeff Sessions was the, was the attorney general that initiated the prosecution of these people. He, wants to, he wanted to put um, all the dispensaries out of business to shut the states down. I mean— you know, this is a, a, a similar scenario. We give 31 uh, licenses, and then the feds come in and arrest all the people with the license. Well, hopefully the feds are going to decriminalize or de- declassify uh, marijuana. It should have never been in a class Schedule One anyway. Right, and Schedule One are drugs, uh, well, are substances where there is no medical use. And we know that that's a bunch of bull crap. That's why they call it medical cannabis it's a it is medical cannabis it's not recreational it does this cannabis does not get you high so you know i don't see why it took us so long i think that's the thing that aggravates me the most is when i look at this is that uh you know senator melson and i think he did an excellent job but you wonder what how come it takes two years to do be able to do something like this uh, you know it's come up before in the state house before and it didn't even didn't even get air i mean didn't go anywhere so that'll show you how fast it's changed in the last couple of years um uh, i venture to say that we'll be moving into recreational marijuana but we probably will be state 49 or 50 before we decide to do it
My prediction, uh, it, it won't get out of either the Senate or the House. I think if it does, I believe the governor would sign it, um, seeing it, it was her committee and all that came up with this idea. And she seems to be a practical person. Do you agree? Mm, uh, I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> Sympathetic. 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 Another, I'll, another go, with, I'll go with sympathetic. So, um, do you have that video ready for us about the... Uh, so, so Paul, there's a... there's a, uh, The governor announced two grants this past week. One of them is for the city of Satsuma, and one of them is for the city of Baymanette. And uh, this video will explain a little bit to you about what the city of Baymanette intends to spend their money on. So, run it for us, Nick. Well, a safety alert, Bay Minette police officers over in, um, in Baldwin County have taken to the streets better equipped to take on violent criminals. NBC 15's Corey Pippen is live tonight in Bay Minette, where Grant is helping authorities stay prepared for the unthinkable. Corey? Well, Greg Kim, a state grant will help pay for each Baymanette police officer to be equipped with an AR-15 rifle. Authorities say more firepower is needed to protect the community from criminals intent on committing violence. Tonight, each unpredictable call a Baymanette police officer takes, they'll do so armed with a handgun and department-issued shotgun. But soon, each officer will have backup. A patrol AR-15 rifle, similar to this one, now essentially standard equipment for law enforcement around the country. Just for the simple fact of the increase in violence and the violent acts that we see and suspects take against the public and us and the type of weapons that they're using are greater than what we normally carry. Baymanet Police Chief Al Tolbert says the department will purchase around 30 rifles thanks to a $24,000 state grant. It's a need, he says, made clearer not only by the rash of violence against law enforcement, but recent church shootings in Texas. It don't have to be a well-populated area of big cities. One of the church shootings was in a, you know, a very rural setting, kind of comparable to our city or our community. Chief Tolbert says with the courthouse, county jail, and four school campuses inside city limits, officers can't take the chance of thinking it couldn't happen here. Our hope is it never occurs and we never have to use these weapons, but we can't control every single act or every single emotion that you know individuals have. What we can do is better prepare ourselves to address that issue when it occurs or if it occurs. I'm told each officer will undergo extensive training with the rifles which are expected to be here at the department within the next two months. Reporting live in Baymanette tonight, I'm Corey Pippen, NBC 15 News. All right, so Chief Talbert says because of increased mass shootings and violence across the country in a time when violent crime has dropped significantly in Alabama, um, his guys can't do their job because they're outmanned, outgunned. When's the last time you heard of a homicide in Baymanet, Alabama? I hadn't heard of any massive gunfights up there either. No, <laughs> no, 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 no big gun battles. Um, and so this brings me to my, do you have, don't, don't we have a image of that, uh, the nonsensical. So, so this is a, uh, a crude interpretation of, uh, it is fruitless to speculate about the counterfactual situations. In other words, if Alabama had a decent field goal kicker, they would have won how many more games, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, it, Ifs and buts. So, uh, which brings me to my uh, one of my favorite anecdotal lines: If my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle. <laughs> you ever heard that one? No. Well, I mean, you know, how do you think these ARs are going to be used, Paul? Mm -hmm. You think they're going to be used in in suppressing some kind of hostile street fight, or do you think it's going to be used to shoot a guy on the side of the road during a traffic stop? Well, I I don't have any idea, but. And, the, and neither almost, does anybody else, but we, almost, we certainly need them. And you know what? If you can't do your job with the greatest communications system in the world, a fully equipped vehicle, a pistol, a shotgun, a taser, body armor, you know, maybe law enforcement ain't for you. Maybe, maybe you need to go find another profession. 
But the idea that if something happens with the sheriff's department, all these intergovernmental task force, a SWAT team, you know, if, if there's a situation, I'll assure you, there will be able to, uh, it's like Rain said, there'll be so many damn ARs in the parking lot, you, you know, just borrow one from somebody. Be a war zone and bam and that. Well, I, I sure don't know why we'd want to have a bunch of uh, tricked out uh, weapons like that. And of course, in, at the same in the same breath, it, it's one of those places where uh, they we don't want we don't want our citizenry to have these weapons, but we want law enforcement to have them. It's the 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 weaponization of law enforcement in this country has gone on long enough. And uh, if you know if you can't do your job with a pistol and a shotgun, you need to find another line of work. Well, there's a lot of units that uh, a lot of police units around the country that have the uh, Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle. That's what every municipality should have at least one. So, do you know the longest confirmed kill in the world was made by a uh, a Canadian sniper with that thing? He shot a guy from one, and, and the problem with long shots is and. You did this shit right, and Nam right. is confirmation. You shoot somebody from three quarters of a mile away, you ain't gonna walk down there and say, "Hey, this is a guy I shot." Right? Well, well, yeah, but you got that far away. You got windage and elevation that can change two to three times before you get to the target. Well, so. this guy shot from one mountain to the one mountainside to the other in Afghanistan, crossing a valley. Right? Cross, yeah, right. it was incredible. Um, so you know, hell, we there may be a situation one day, Paul, where uh, we need to shoot some Somali snipers. I mean, some Somali pirates, and uh, we might need that Barrett. So let's let's write a federal grant. You know, of all the needs that we have in Baymanette, a bunch of damn ARs is, is uh, n- not high priority in my book. I think it's a stretch. All right, Paul. Um, are we doing, uh, we're doing the Lanyap Review, RIP Report. Right, right. Um, on the Lanyap Review this week, uh, glad to tell you now that you can get Lanyap at the Florabama. And speaking of Florabama, there's an article uh, under Bay Brief this is by Jason Johnson, the golden one, Gulf Shores native, uh, an L.A.-based comedian and musician, Whitmer Thomas, who grew up in Gulf Shores, has returned to shoot his full-length comedy special at where else? No other than the Florabama, called The Golden One. It'll premiere on HBO Saturday, February 22nd. And I guess, you know, at Florabama, they have a church, they have multiple bars, recreation, and maybe if they have uh, recreational marijuana, they might have the first marijuana vending machine at the Florabama. You can go, go to church, have a drink, get a lottery ticket, <laughs> and do all that in one place. <laughs> so the next one is from classroom to courtroom. We've covered this several times. This is Bay Brief. This is uh, Gabe Times wrote this. And the former college administrators continue to fight the terminations, and this has been in and out of the paper. You know, we read you the uh, and we've done. We've got two anonymous letters where, over this. yeah, it kind of covers it, but not specifically related to Ms. Burke. But uh, of course, you know, Laura's a uh, few years ahead of me in school. We went to high school together. Um, I followed her career, and uh, what happened to her was a bunch of bull. Right, right. And somebody needs to do something about it, and somebody needs to pay for it. And the chancellor of the secondary college system and uh, the new Dr. Pouncey, um, you know, he stepped into that role. Um, Of course, you know, now hell is in the hands of the attorneys, which I'm, you know, uh, not to say anything begrudging about my colleagues, but I'm sure they'll have it all straightened out in no time. Right. Burks was terminated in 2019 after a peer review team concluded she fraudulently altered a document and failed to perform her duties. A decision, the, the complaint notes, was upheld by a hand-picked state-appointed officer after a personnel hearing last year. Burks, the, through her attorney, Tom Looper, argued the defense and witnesses proved she was innocent of the alleged fraud while while extenuating circumstances exacerbated by the broadening role during the consolidation of the schools, which was uh, uh, Faulkner, 
Jefferson State Junior College or Community College now. Man, oh, man, what some years ago. I, that was, I went to the first year of Jefferson State College that they were open and the Alabama Community College. But um, that, that decision is on appeal, filed on February 6th. The school's not yet responded. Meanwhile, another former administrator of CACC was handed a favorable decision by the administrative law judge uh, through the attorney uh, general's office. Um, these things happen, it seems like, every time they change power, somebody gets you know, the big idea that they want to change everybody in there. And sometimes these people have tenure and you need to look a little bit closer. I can, I'll can, i bet that uh, in the end she probably will win her case, but we'll see. Also under Bay Brief with Don Leach is uh, tariffs on EU goods won't impact Airbus aircraft made in Mobile. In a statement released uh, Friday, February 14th, Office of U.S. Trade Representatives Robert Litson, sir, announced a revision of the previous notice of $7.5 billion worth of tariffs based on uh, statements made during a public comment period that removes the parts shipping from Europe to Airbus uh, A320 finally ass- final assembly line in uh, Mobile, and that is real good news. All right, uh, so Airbus is actually European Airspace Corporation. They are high, uh, heavily subsidized. And um, there were a lot of people up in Washington State, especially that work for Boeing, um, who see this as unfair. And and I want to, I just wanted to let everybody know, just because Airbus is down here doesn't mean we're whitewashing the issue. We completely understand that that you know it, they're a foreign corporation, but they are building airplanes in in Mobile, Alabama. Airbus's U.S. manufacturing hub in Mobile will once again be spared from tariffs slapped on many goods coming to the country from European Union member states, but the aircraft manufacturer still regrets the overall decision, calling it regrettable. And Boeing, as far as I'm concerned, can so cr- Paul, I have a I have an interesting theory about this. Yeah, who who was the guy that uh, works for uh, Hicks Snedeker Company? He's their COO. He used to work for. Uh, uh, he used to be the chief of staff for Mr. Mobile. Co- Mr. Cooper, Colby Cooper. Colby Cooper. Yeah. So you remember he got canned because he went and cut down the community Christmas tree and had it put up for Trump's visit? Cut down a tree out of a park in Mobile, and the people in Mobile didn't have a sense of humor about it. <laughs> well, but just see what we got in return for it. Because we cut down the Christmas tree and showed goodwill towards the president, he's now decided that the Airbus uh, tariffs uh, shall not be applicable to Mobile. Well. Uh, the other one in Bay Breeze by Jason Johnson, uh, National Defense, DOD proposal would divert money. I talked from, about this last week. Yeah. They're going to take money away from Austell. They, what did it cost us? Three ships? They're going to uh, take three ships worth of money no, and build it, a wall? No, it's going to tap $3.8 billion appropriated for military equipment. Now, that's going to yeah, come that out of automobile. No, that's going to be the Department of Justice. What comes out of the Austell part would be about $261 million. And the um, Democratic candidates for the first U.S. congressional district also denounced the idea during a joint press conference. Um, Mr. Rick Collins, in particular, said the repurposing of these DOD funds proves that Mexico was never going to pay for the wall. Uh, Austell currently holds a $1.9 billion contract to build 14 ships, and the $261 million would have gone toward the 15th ship with 11 more surface ships yet to be delivered to the Navy, including two EPFs that were awarded to us under a year ago. We have a strong backlog and a lot to do over the next few years. Um, the As always, we'll continue to focus on what we can control, delivering great ships to our great Navy at the cost of the schedule. That approach has served us very well in the past and they, Austell does not expect that this is going to hold them up for very long since we're talking about only one ship that's going to be held up. Then, last but not least, damn the torpedoes. Um, this is by Rob Holbert. 
more nutty ideas in Alabama's reproductive wars. This is something that will uh, give you a little bit to think about. Is this the gang sign for the <laughs> Alabama legislature this year? Well, snip, snip. Snip, snip. Theoretically, we're all aware of the law passed last year banning abortions, even in the case of rape or incest that was uh, signed into law by Governor Islet. Sounds Ivy. sounds like a sound plan. Uh, yeah, well, adding to the reproductive funds, uh, fund, uh, State Representative Rolanda Hollis has now introduced a bill mandating that any man over the age of 50 or who has three biological children will be snipped. That's, uh, I hope everybody knows what snip means. <laughs> the, the V word. <laughs> right. The vasectomy word. The vasectomy. Of course, all of this is rather ludicrous. Hollis is just trying to make the point with her bill, and she's done a pretty good job of it, but it gives you something to think about, guys, when uh, shoes on the other foot, right? So we'll see what happens with that bill and where it goes. So, Paul, you missed a few. Was that? Well, usually Paul bitches about a red in Fairhope. Paul bitches about some land in Fairhope. Paul bitches about <laughs> Catalyst, and Paul kisses the mayor's ass. Well, I'm I'm getting to Catalyst. Okay, you're giving, getting there. I'm getting to Catalyst. Yeah, I'm just trying to keep up. All right, ticking them off. Go yeah. ahead. Oh well, no, I was going to do that under elections. Okay, so, so I want to switch gears, Nick. Um, you got a video for me, don't you? Uh, high water and coal ash. Uh, right now. Uh, with all the rain that we've had north of here, and it's, it's it did rain up until about six this morning, and then it, the temperature it's, finally dropped off. Yeah, yeah. So we we went from about what seventy five on on Wednesday down to about forty three this morning. <clears throat> Right, but we have we have still a lot of rain up in Montgomery, Birmingham area, which is you know drifting down this way. So all this water, just think of it as a as a wave in the river. That's that's the only way I can describe it to you, and it's coming downhill towards Mobile Bay. Um, several places there are hydroelectric dams with locks. Um, they'll hold a certain amount of water and release it at certain times of year, but almost every year. Uh, without fail, we have a high water. Um, right now, Barry Steam Plant, the water is at 16 feet above uh, normal, whatever that means. 16 feet. Yes, sir. And ha- just how high do you think these berms are around that, <laughs> around that impoundment? Um, <laughs> and you can see the video going behind us, which shows, you know, I've been by there many, many times, and I just hate to admit that I had no idea there was a big pile of coal ash right on the other side of that berm right there on the Mobile River. Well, now, there's a, there's a legislation being proposed, too, that's uh, going to insulate Alabama power, isn't it? From- right. So Senate Bill 117 it has been slowly slithering its way through the legislature. Um, what it will do is it will redefine what a landfill is. Right Currently, you uh, – well, anyway – uh, it's Alabama Power Company's legislation. I'll guarantee you, you won't hear a thing about it in any any media news outlet. I would think that the Land Yacht will probably have an article about it next time. But uh, nobody's talking about it. It's absolutely on the down low. So what will happen is if it floods and there is damage, they'll go back to that legislation and say, hey, we're not a landfill or whatever. Well, what they want to do, and maybe this is a good time to pivot into this just a little bit, Uh, besides going to Montgomery Wednesday, Paul and I spent two and a half hours last night in Robertsdale at the uh, Baldwin County Commission uh, strategic planning meeting, uh, the public participation portion. And one of the things that that I brought up that – uh, at the end of the meeting, almost as an afterthought, was I, for one, demand that the Baldwin County Commission come out with a position on this uh, on this coal ash because everybody has punted. Uh, Baldwin County and Mobile Counties both gave money to the uh, Mobile Bay Estuary Program to produce a video so we can better understand the issue. Meanwhile, uh, it's all a stall tactic so that uh, Alabama Power Company can go have the definition of what a landfill is changed so they can just stick uh, leave this stuff there and cover it up on the banks of the river. 
Uh, well, I was, I was impressed by the planning meeting last night. It was uh, very, very nasty weather. I'm talking about most people wouldn't have got out, so I didn't think there would be a crowd there, but it was quite full. Uh, the, there was a, there was even another lawyer there. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the thing that the thing that got me or kind of reassured me because you know I'm always bitching about one thing or another, but <laughs> but the thing that reassured me was that the whole room was full of people all the way from Stockton to Gulf Shores that were complaining about the exact same thing over and over and over again. And, um, you know, these are all being listed and they're talking about it. And I was trying to make a point to the on the slide presentation. There's a standing slide up there. It says, what do you think or forecast what is going to happen in the next two to three years? And so everybody is, you know, speaking about the problems. And I think what was missed is that we're speaking about problems that exist right now, immediately. We're already, we're already seeing these issues. And, um, you know, we don't have any sewer regulation. And we got subdivisions going up everywhere. The subdivisions butt into a road but pay nowhere near the impact that they have on that highway you got jurisdictional issues where, let's say you have a county road, but the city is, the city businesses are all impacting that county road. So that puts the burden on the county to improve the road, whereas it should be upon the developer. And of course, we're talking about a road in Fairhope that leads to Paul's house. Oh, I, I, used I, I, to I, have 30, used to have what, 13 no, residents on it? It has about, this is Park Road, is. 500 feet, less than 500 feet long. I promise you this is the truth. There's about 15 houses that were coming on to Park Road that goes right beside Publix. With the apartments being added, the townhomes being added, it is there are 355 units planned to go that are going to be coming in and out on that 500 foot road <laughs> next to Publix. And of course, you know, Publix, they want to, they're trying to give you this illusion that Publix is a uh, grandiose luxury village. It's a strip center with an apartment behind is what it's amounting to. So, I, you know, it, you just, it's like the frog in the pot. You're watching it boil and you're waiting for somebody to do something. And nobody does anything until it's too late. That's, that's where we're going with that intersection there at 98 and uh, Parker. Trust me, if you go through there, be very, very careful. It is dangerous and it's fixing to get a lot more compacted once these uh, apartments are open. And the apartments were approved against the wishes of the citizens. The, the city councils that there is now yeah, just... There's, the, there's no need to say that, Paul. Yes, sir. Everybody is. understands that everything that gets done in Fairhope typically done is done against the wishes of the majority of the people. Right. And, I, and you know why? Because you have people on the city council, and this is the truth, you have people on the city council that honestly feel because they were elected that you have given them the right to do whatever they decide to do regardless of the public. Because you've already and elected them. that's why they got to go. So that's what they're just saying. Yeah, that's why they got to go. So a couple of issues that I brought up last night. Uh, right now we have two planners on staff. That's up from one that we had for a decade. Uh, I'm talking about land use planners. Um, we have two currently. I think they need to hire a transportation planner, which would have been on the radar. Uh, your issue would have been on that radar. Uh, an environmental planner um, and a long-range planner. We need three new planners tomorrow. And, and, and the reason being, and I've, I've spoken about this for years too, you have 14 municipalities in Baldwin County, and you have the county commission, and at times they're all going in 15 different directions. Daphne will do something that's impacting Fairhope, but Fairhope knows nothing about it. And the same thing happens over and over oh, again. Do you know what I heard last night that made me – if I'd have been drinking milk, it would have come out of my damn nose. What was that? They said, we're going to get together. Why don't y'all get together with, with all the mayors and just make some decisions? <clears throat> well, like, like, I said, like I said, these, these, these are problems that exist now, not 
not things that you're trying to that's forecast. another good that's another good point a yeah. lot of people were there to talk about current issues oh, right uh, they weren't talking about what what you're forecasting as a problem two or three years from now we're talking about sewer water drainage impact fees mm-hmm. schools uh you know you put in i think of stormwater uh, management stormwater management in fair hope you're going to have over I believe approved or being built almost 800 apartments how do you think that is going to impact schools? Because when you look at the rent on apartments and you think, well, who would pay $1,600 for an apartment? i tell you who would be someone that wants to put their kids in a good school. Right. And so they'll pay that and higher I'm, rate. And then I'm not taking anything away from them one bit. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying they can start building a brand new school in Fairhope now. And by probably by the time they get through building it, they're going to need another one at the rate we're going. A hundred people a week move to Bowen County. A hundred people a week. That's crazy. Now, Fairhope, Fairhope also has a movie being filmed. I thought this was, I, I really wondered about this. They have a movie that's uh, being filmed there. And, um, they want to call the little town that is supposed to be the uh, subject of the movie Fairhope, and I'm just thinking, wow, that's going to be great. Let's let's <laughs> let's get another fifty thousand people in here and see what's going on, you know. So I was hoping that Reigns would be with us um, because this is just hilarious. Um, a new ethics bill has been proposed. Oh, boy. Which is actually worse than all Britons from last year. I heard it's a tie. Um, so, just one more time, just because I love her. Well, these are a couple of high-stepping high ter- uh, turkeys, and you know what to say about a high-stepper. No step too high for a high-stepper. So, uh, what I think is afoot is that his friends in the legislature, Mike Ball, who's the chairman of the Ethics Committee um, from Madison, Alabama, usually a pretty progressive place, they're trying to pass a bill to essentially make what Mike Hubbard is convicted of doing no longer illegal. And they're that, trying to say that if you're a legislator, you can go have a relationship with a third party to act as their lobbyist. And, I mean, it's the one thing that legislators can't do. They can't lobby on behalf of private enterprise. They're supposed to be representing the people in their district. Well, the the other part of it, too, I think, is uh, trying to make uh, the Ethics Commission the central location for complaints, which is laughable. Oh, shit. Which so is, the worst which thing is totally, about it is... Which is totally laughable. So the, so the Ethics Commission, the, an, another caveat in this bill is the Ethics Commission would have to give permission to the Attorney General or any local district attorney before they could prosecute anyone under this new ethics law, which is just a bunch of... Bull crap. Only in Alabama. And in and as long And remember, who appoints these people to the Ethics Commission? <laughs> to the the go. Damn legislators. <laughs> legislators. Sure they do. Uh, uh, well, it's something I mean it's laughable, but it's a, extremely serious because at this point in time you can't get anyone to investigate anything. You can give them you can give the attorney general, district attorney, it doesn't make any difference. Ethics commission, bar association, judiciary, you can give them the most profound facts and evidence that there is, and no one, absolutely no one is being investigated or held accountable. And uh, I can assure you that is cal- that type of political corruption is costing every single citizen money every one of us that's costing us money that type of political corruption all right legal news um one week after there was a uh, complaint to the judicial inquiry commission coleman county district judge um Let's see. I've got his name somewhere. Kim Cheney uh, retired. Now, here's the allegation. His son's also an attorney, and he's appointed his son to over 200 cases uh, that he presided over where his son was being paid by the state of Alabama to represent an an indigent person. Like, first day of school kind of ethics stuff. Right. And, um, you know, if... Typically, if you violate uh, the the ethics law, you know there's some new teeth in it where uh, they 
claw back your retirement. There's, I mean, it's 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 tough as it's got some damn shoulders to it right now. No, no, Harry. The Ethics Commission has rotten teeth. There's not a sound tooth in the Ethics Commission. That's probably true. That's me talking, please. All right. Well, let's uh let's move on. I here's my I want to give everybody a reminder. Well, Harry, you are entitled to any animus that's directed against you. Uh, you have no good purpose in any of the things you're doing other than to muck rake around, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows it, He's which is why raker. I'm doing another public service uh, announcement. Uh, today is severe weather sales tax holiday, um, <laughs> and hopefully Nick is going to get this thing up before... Um, Right, let's hope so. Um, hope, hopefully, we'll get it up today uh, because it's Friday, the twenty first of February. Um, sales tax holiday. So, if you've been waiting to get you uh, a generator, if you're a contractor, today would be a great day to swing by and get you a new chainsaw and a generator at Lowe's or Home Depot or uh, Tractor Supply. I'm trying to think of some places around. I don't want to plug anybody necessarily um paul tell me what else you got man well next uh week after this coming tuesday march 3rd will be the primary uh the one primary election that we're looking at here in baldwin county is the first congressional district you got five choices in that uh election you got one catalyst candidate i for one i'm proposing that you do not vote for any catalyst candidate at all, be it the 1st Congressional District, the uh, City Council, or whatever it is. Um, Catalyst candidates are not looking out in your best interest. So please be aware that Catalyst candidate is is Mr. Bill Hightower. He's associated himself with these people. So we can only judge by the fact that uh, what Catalyst's reputation has been in the past. Now, the RIP report is not for profit. We're a consumer association, and uh, Catalyst is a for profit. Uh, accumulates these candidates on a block basis uh, to where they really are all promoting themselves. So the last thing we need in Congress is a, uh, a congressional candidate that's candidate that's catalyst we don't need a catalyst congressman but you do need to vote on the primary on uh march 3rd don't forget we'll be reminding you again next week we had one more video that i wanted us to take a look at um let me see here this um the mobile police department so you know how we talked about they had four the I guess the county had four officer involved shootings uh, in the month of January, and now a video has surfaced of uh, the guy a, a police officer that's been officer of the year like uh, twice or officer of the month uh, last month and one more one other time in 2018 um, a video surfaced of him applying a chokehold and slamming a fellow who was already in handcuffs head against the car. You know, I saw that video and I'd like to see it again. I hadn't seen any comments on it, but it looked to me like Like he got spit on. Correct. It looked to me like he spit on the officer. Now that's assault. You know, well, so. it is, but you wait till you get him in the car and you tase him in the balls. You don't do it while you're trying to get him in the car. And <laughs> well, I, I don't know how I'd react if somebody spit on me, but uh, I did see the video. And, well, uh, here, here's what I'm trying to say about it, Paul. You're these guys are trained to correct be prepared for stressful situations and dealing with people who are disrespectful and spit mental, on them mental illness mentally, everything yeah else. i mean yeah. this, this yeah. guy could have been and it's my understanding uh it's not like somebody called this is somebody they rolled up on he was a homeless guy or a vagrant or something yeah you know and it's how we treat the uh unfortunate people in our society is how we are judged not how we treat president trump and governor ivy right well 
Well, well you're right. And the training, the, the training of a police officer, mm -hmm. those stressful situations like that, that's, that is part of the training. Ready to run it? That is part of the training. All right. We're going to let y'all take a look at it. All right. First on five, What's Mobile this? Police have been our top story now two nights in a row, and not for good reasons. Today, a video going viral raises concerns about excessive force. And just last night, we showed you the two Mobile Police officers that recently left the department in mid-investigations into their behavior. News 5's Dana Winter sat down with Mobile's police chief getting to the bottom of what's going on. She joins us now live from police headquarters. Dana, what did the chief have to say? Roseanne, Chief Batiste tells us he cannot give us any details about any of the investigations because they are ongoing. But when we sat down with him here at headquarters just a couple of hours ago, he did say Mobile Police take any potentially negative actions of its officers very seriously. Oh my God, that's ridiculous. This video has more than 900 shares on our Facebook. The woman who took it says it happened on Tuesday at the corner of Lafayette and St. Stephen's Road in Mobile. Mobile Police Chief Lawrence Batiste tells News 5 as soon as he received this video, he launched an internal investigation. We know what happened uh, after the stop, but we don't know particularly what happened before the stop. We don't know what precipitated uh, the behavior that occurred. Chief Batiste says the officer shown in the video, Blake Duke, has been placed on desk duty while the department works on this incident. This is not the only issue Mobile Police are dealing with this week. On Tuesday, Public Safety Director James Barber confirmed to News 5 two officers left the department while under investigation. Now Chief Batiste says Mobile County's district attorney could get involved. We submitted reports for review for potential uh, charges. He says those charges could be criminal, but says none of the investigations into any of the officers are related. Every one of these incidents, the one from yesterday, uh, the other two officers, they are all independent investigations. They, they are not interrelated in any kind of way. Chief Batiste says he will continue talking to us about investigations, showing the public police are working to remain transparent. He says each of these incidents come along with serious allegations, and he will ensure appropriate action is taken. Reporting live outside of Mobile Police Headquarters tonight, I'm Dana Winter for WKRG News 5. So you heard from Chief Baptiste there. Um, they're looking into it and they're taking it very seriously they as should. they should. They should. Um, a couple more things, uh, I've happened to, after last week's, uh, I don't know how to say it. I'm really kind of disappointed, uh, but I understand where he's coming from. Uh, our superintendent of education, Eddie Tyler appeared on channel five news the other morning with the largest developer in Baldwin County, Mr. Cox. And he said, uh, we love growth. We love development. Bring it on. Um, but they're trying to communicate with developers. Um, you know, I think he's more of a politician than an administrator. Well, they should be looking at impact fees if he wants to do anything. Talk about that, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> we'll see where that goes. That's what should be looked at uh, as a special impact fee for schools, or you're just going to be taxing yourself to death over here. And uh, they, like I said, they can start building one school right now before they get it done. You know, they're going to need another school at the rate that we're growing. It's supposed to be 100 people a week. I think it's more than that, actually, for Baldwin County. So I, uh, I sent a, a laundry list of questions to John Wilson, who is the uh, yeah, chief financial that. officer? Um, I wanted to know. It it appears to me that the uh, <laughs> the school board is giving eighty thousand dollars a year to the educational foundations, which were allegedly grassroots and you know started from the ground up. But uh, they they appear to be giving them some money, and then uh, just some other various and sundry. Um, I wanted to know. Uh, who their lobbyist is, how much they're paying him, um, how much money is going into uh, uh, attorney's fees and those types of things. You know, I don't understand why for spending 
three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars a year to pay outside counsel for something, it just seems like you would have in in house counsel to ha- to handle the day to day. And if there was major litigation, you would farm that out to someone or, or or turn it over to your insurance company, and they would. Well, I heard I saw where he replied to you to give him a little time, and he was going to give all those figures to you. That's that's what the man said. Yep. So we'll I, see. I'll hold him to it. We'll see. Uh, all right. Don't forget, folks. Uh, February twenty second is when uh, L.A. based comedian and musician Whitmire Thomas from Gulf Shores, the Golden Want to be at the Florabama. That's one thing I don't have to tell you is how to get to the Florabama. When you get there, you might uh, you step inside. You might see uh, Dr. Chris Warner there. He's got about twenty six books that he's written. Everything from several series books from Florabama, and also he wrote a very good one, The Wagon of Disaster, about Richard Scrooge in um, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. But uh, stop in, tell Chris you heard us on the podcast, and for a little bit of humor, be sure to attend the Golden One, February 22nd at the Florabama. And that is going to be, is that Showtime, or what did I tell you, HBO special. So can you go and you, you can be on television? Well, if they pan the audience, or maybe if you do something, you know, lewd or <laughs> to draw attention to yourself, maybe. Do they still have bras all over the ceiling? They back, do. Back in the day, the girls would take their bras off and they give them a staple gun. They staple it to the ceiling. Trust me, that happens not Not that I would know anything about anything right. that ever happened no, in that place. That, that, that happens as of today. You know, the, the very first time i ever went to the floor bama was about 19 it was the first year it was open i think it was 64 65 64 somewhere in there and i was at the intersection of 59 right at the beach there and joe namath was walking across the street i lived in tuscaloosa at the time and knew him I said, Joe, where'd you get the beer? And he said, go to Florabama. He said, just keep going. He said, it'll get dark, but you'll come on it. And there was no lights. You couldn't see. Oh, no, it was it was completely. And, and, the, and Florabama at that time, was I, the best I remember, was like a 20 by 40 block building with, I mean, just concrete block building sitting in the middle of nowhere. And that's how it started from there. But be sure to go out. It's fun. Be sure to do that and um, hang around. It's worth your time to watch the end of this video. We're gonna uh, let uh, gov- we're gonna let you hear the entirety of Governor Ivy's high stepper speech. And with that, I'm gonna give you guys some outro music, and we're gonna let uh, Nick take care of it. Paul, you got anything else you'd like to let us know? Have a good and safe weekend. That's uh, number twenty three in the can, right? Correct. Correct. All right. Well, you boys and girls have a good weekend. Hope you learned something and had fun. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank y'all for being here to continue this wonderful and long-lasting Thanksgiving tradition. And I'm very glad to have all of you here to celebrate this with us. This Alabama custom to celebrate parting of the turkeys goes back to 1949. Now, that's even before Mercedes accelerated our state <laughs> in the automotive sector. And that's before man walked on the moon. And that's even before the people of Alabama elected their first female Republican governor. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been a while, but it's evident our state is making significant progress in many areas. And today, I think we've got two turkeys that are looking for some success of their own. Clyde and Henrietta, today may very well be your special day because, like always, Alabama's open for business. <laughs> yeah. When I was going about to assume the office of governor, I had three hours' notice. Now, it may be that Clyde and Henrietta hope I only take three minutes. <laughs> but as governor, all my efforts are to move Alabama forward and to do what's right and best for our people. And so, at this moment, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, I just want us all to pause and give thanks for all the many blessings we are blessed with here in this great state. We are truly blessed, and it's a time to give sincere thanks. 
We're in a state where opportunities are growing and the beauty of our state reflects that of our people and we're always ready in Alabama to lend a helping hand to our neighbors when they are in need. Thanksgiving is also a time, y'all know, to give thanks for our freedom and to especially give thanks for the men and women who serve in the military and protect that freedom. And especially do we say thank you to our Alabama men and women who serve so valiantly and continue to protect our freedoms. This Thanksgiving season allows us not only to give thanks for our blessings, but also for our challenges. And yes, we have challenges in Alabama, but we don't, we're not blinded by them. In fact, we have determination and a strong will to move right on past them and make progress. And y'all please know that I am honored to continue to lead Alabama. And I appreciate the people giving me the opportunity and the responsibility to continue our to continue leading our state as we take our next steps forward. And as we are steering the ship of state and getting it steady, which we've done, I think that having Clyde and Henry Atta on board would add even more to Great Alabama. After all, these are a couple of high-stepping tur uh, turkeys, and you know what to say about a high-stepper. No step too high for a high-stepper. So now for the moment we've all been waiting for. This year, I'm pleased to announce that I will pardon both of our turkeys today. So Clyde and Henrietta, by the power vested in me, I hereby pardon you from the succulent trappings of a Thanksgiving dinner. And may you live out your lives, the rest of your lives, with each other and have much peace and happiness on the Bates farm. And Becky, I just want to thank you and your entire family for being so devoted to the turkey farm and to this tradition. I want to say thank you to Commissioner McMillan and also to uh, Johnny Adams and the Alabama Poultry Association for your support and to everyone for showing up today to remember this annual tradition. And Clyde, I know you're happy that you can go home this afternoon with Henrietta at your side and live happily ever after on the Bates farm. So y'all all have a happy Thanksgiving. May God continue to bless each of you and the great state of Alabama. Thank you, Governor.